and welcome to The Full Scottish here on Broadcasting Scotland. I'm Kenny McBride and I'm joined today by three guests. Um, we're, we're a full house today, so on my far left I've got James Dornan, MSP. Morning. And Sam Payton from the Save Walk Hiya. Open campaign. And here we've got Lizzie Eldridge. How are we all this morning? Good, good, good. good. Thanks. Well, um, that is, it's good to hear that we are all at least healthy. Um, our first story is about coronavirus. Um, we've seen uh, a bit of a, a, a ramping up of concern about coronavirus. Uh, there have been deaths in a number of countries, the first death in Thailand, first death in the United States, um, further deaths in the UK. Um, we've uh, got some word from the Scottish Government. Uh, they are stepping up their preparations. Um, there is work going on with uh, the UK Government, with the Welsh Government and the Northern Ireland is Executive. Um, basically, they're, they're encouraging everybody, wash your hands first and foremost. That's the, the big one as far as uh, preventing the spread. Um, they're also advising if you're traveling or if you're coming back from uh, one of the risk areas, um, then there, are, there is advice available uh, online. If you go to the NHS Inform website, uh, if you go to Fit for Tra the Fit for Travel website, uh, if you're going abroad, um, and also the Scottish Government website has reports on uh, how many, how, what tests have been done and how many new cases are being identified. Um, so we've, well, I've asked this um, of at least you two, I think, uh, James, I've, we've not had you on the show while we've talked about, been talking about this. Um, so I will ask you, how worried are you about coronavirus? Uh, as time goes by, I get slightly more worried about it. I mean, in terms, I don't really worry about it so much myself. I think the idea of me catching it is, is a bit limited, but who knows? You know, Scotland, without a doubt, is going to have a positive coronavirus at some stage. And then after that, it depends on, on how well people react to the information that they've been given. I thought at first it was another over-exaggerated scare story, mm -hmm. which we get periodically about different types of flus and stuff like that, but this does look like being the real thing. And uh, you can see in the way that governments all over the world are reacting to it. I think we have to, be, we have to take the advice very, very seriously and be on our guard. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of how uh, governments around the world are reacting, uh, the Americans have suddenly got frantic about this, uh, the coronavirus this week, um, but President Trump has handed the responsibility for it to Mike Pence, um, who uh, I'm not sure even believes that science is a thing. Um, and they're, they're kind of shutting down, letting people uh, in the scientific establishment talk about it. Um, what do you think, uh, what do you think the, the Trump strategy is there? Do you, do, you th do, you th do you think it's That's just a phrase I've never heard before? <laughs> do, you, do you think it's just that he, he thinks if if we don't talk about it and we just think positive that it'll go away, or is there? Do you think he's he's trying to cover something up? Well, I mean, <laughs> I'm going to say my phrase is all. I'm really that surprised. Um, with Trump, um, the end of the day, that it, it seems to be if it doesn't fit in with his week and a you know, bubble of the world, it doesn't exist, it's not real, it's not there. Um, so, yeah, I'm of the opinion that he's just going to try and get on it doesn't exist and it's not there and see what happens, I don't know, but yeah. it's Trump, we never know how, what he thinks. Yeah, and uh, of course the, this has been, it's taken a big toll on the, the American stock market this week. Um, we've also heard, I mean, it's been, it's been affecting the Chinese, uh, Chinese industry for, for weeks now. Um, there's several factories, several industries that have pretty much ground to a halt. Um, the, the American Stock Exchange this week took a 1,200-point dive, sorry, on Friday, took a 1,200-point dive, uh, one of the biggest uh, drops in history. Um, how, how concerned are we that this is going to lead to a, a, another kind of global recession? Well, personally speaking, because I'm not a business person, <laughs> Um, but it's quite funny, as soon as it affects money, people start taking things seriously, maybe even Trump yeah. affects his bank balance. Um, I mean, I've read the same reports that, that things are crashing, and of course China's a big player. Yeah. So once that, you know, if that starts exporting, uh, there's a lot of businesses going to find themselves in trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, like James, I mean, I kind of just thought it was another, oh, here's the latest, greatest virus scare to scare everybody from doing anything. But as I was saying earlier before we came on air, 
I've got a friend who's supposed to be getting married next month and his, his future wife is Chinese and they have cancelled the wedding and they've cancelled it in relation to the information they're getting from China, directly from China, yeah. uh, where she's saying from reports from her family and relatives, it's bad. Yeah, I mean, my, my initial suspicion was that this was a, a case of China kind of overreacting mm -hmm. because they felt that they'd got it wrong with SARS. Uh, but even uh, even allowing for the fact that they've they've put in some incredible uh, measures to try and contain the spread, uh, we talked to uh, Victor from Rostani uh, a few a couple of weeks ago. He'd been on tour there, and he said that the, the measures they've taken are extraordinary. Um, it's still we've seen far more cases than we had with SARS. And uh, the death rate appears to be creeping up. So yeah, um, do do take care. The, the number one thing is if you if you keep your hands clean, um, keep your surfaces clean. You know, try not to cough on people. Uh, try not to have people cough on you. Um, and if you have been to any of these areas, particularly, I think most likely a place that anyone watching the show will have been is uh, northern Italy. Um, if you've been in that sort of region um, or any of these other places where there are significant outbreaks, then do just check the, the advice um, and try and try and see a doctor if you feel that there's a, a, a risk. That if you're having coughing, shortness of breath, uh, and particularly if you have any, um, if you have any immunocompromised, you know, people who are older, people who have asthma, diabetes, um, other immuno, um, immuno, immune uh, conditions. Uh, then do please look after yourself. Uh, we, we really can't afford for this to, to become uh, an epidemic. But anyway, uh, we will move on now. Um, and this is uh, a story about the uh, a Treasury advisor, Dr. Tim Lunig, uh, who is understood to have said that the food sector is not critically important to the British economy and that agriculture and fisheries certainly isn't. Um, so these some leaked emails to the, the new Chancellor, Rishi Sunak, um, he's reported to have said that uh, Britain could follow the example of Singapore, which is rich without having its own agricultural <coughs> sector. Um, obviously, Singapore is a small island. <coughs> it doesn't have the, the space to have uh, the kind of agricultural sector that, that we do. Um, but this is, uh, this is obviously going to be quite a, a shock to the, the fishermen and the, the farmers who were sold Brexit as a way to free themselves from EU interference, to be able to, uh, for fishermen particularly, to increase their catch, uh, for farmers not to be bound by some <coughs> of the, the, the bits of the, the common agricultural policy that they're not so fond of. Um, James, with your, with your political hat on, um, is this the kind of thing that uh, the advisors will tell politicians a lot that you can just abandon an industry. It uh, appears to me to be a wee bit of the Marie Antoinette thing where it's uh, food isn't really that important, let them eat cake, you know, that, that uh, they'll get by, it's, it'll be alright for us, doesn't matter for them. For Scotland it's vitally important, I mean farming and fishing are two huge industries in Scotland and it's, this is very much in, in line with the it doesn't matter, and what they mean is it doesn't matter here, mm -hmm. but it does matter up there and they don't even recognise that. And it's a complete disregard that, that anything outside of that southeast of England eh, has been treated with, with the Westminster government. So it's a ridiculous thing to say. You know, briefings have from here to there, but never I've never heard of a, a, a Scottish government briefing that would say, but this industry, which only affects part of Scotland, isn't important because we'd recognise it's important to that part of Scotland, mm -hmm. even if it didn't play a huge role in the economy of the rest of the country. This is a huge part of the economy of Scotland. It's a Scottish food and fishing is, you know, world renowned, and they just don't seem to take it any account at all. I think it's uh, it, it doesn't surprise me. We've been saying all the time that as soon as that votes through, they'll sell you out. And, you know, unfortunately, the farmers and fish, fishermen are finding out now that that's exactly the case. Yeah, and, um, yeah, the, to me, it, it, it strikes me as, as risky, uh, not least because if we're, we're putting up trade barriers with the EU, um, then our, our food supply is likely to be, to be challenged. And um, that's, that's one of the things that's, that uh, certainly some of our uh, food exporters have talked about 
is the, the inability to export fresh produce if, uh, if there are real serious delays at the border. Um, how big do you think this, how big a problem do you think this will be if, if it just gets to the point where, where Britain stops producing as much food? I think it will be a majorly big problem. It could be catastrophic, um, not to exaggerate, but I think it could be a major big problem because um, if we stop producing our own food, um, one, that's jobs, that's livelihoods, it's so much more, and also as well our ability to produce food. I mean, I know farmers and, um, who, yeah, voted for Brexit and the Tories at the general election here because they believed on the fact that all this, these lies, all these things, and trying to explain to them, no, they're, 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 they'll sell you out. And they genuinely did believe this because they believed that they were going to bring back the control of the farms back to here. Mm -hmm. And they have, they've literally, they've stabbed them in the back. They're, they've really sold them out. Um, part of me thinks, look, well, you've believed them. Uh, you know, but at the same time, it's our industry. It's very vital to Scotland. But the other problem is as well, is we export a lot out Mm -hmm. And it's going to destroy our export market for Scotland. It really will for the food and drinks industry. And yeah. it's going to destroy our reputation. Yes. And that is what part of this is all about. Not so much that they're deliberately doing it, but they don't care about it. Mm -hmm. That's for me, that's a big problem. Yeah. They just don't care. They don't even think about us. And it's about time people realise that. Yeah. yeah, and of course this is um, one where the... the the, the, the industry has, uh, in, in Scotland especially, has this, this huge uh, focus on quality. It's one of the big selling points of, of Scottish food, uh, is the, this quality. And now there's, uh, there's the, the increased likelihood that we're going to enter into some sort of trade deal with the US, where food standards are likely to be compromised. Um, do you think that part of this might be just kind of preparing for that to say, well, you know, we don't need to produce our own food because we can get cheap chlorinated chicken and hormone-fed beef from the and coronavirus from the US. because <laughs> of the lack of standards. Yeah, all looks good. Um, I don't know if there's a coordinated plan, you know, um, <laughs> or if it's just, uh, you know, flapping around like the drowning people. I don't. There was no plan behind Bre Brexit. Mm -hmm. You know, waking up the next day when it had been people voted to leave, there was no plan. So nothing had been put in place and then it took however many years, three, four years to actually get to where we are now, which is not a great place either. And going back to the farmers, the farmers have always traditionally voted Tory. I mean, I remember this when I was a child. Um, and I remember too, 2016, the day after the Brexit vote, and Cornwall had voted to leave. Mm -hmm. And they depend on subsidies from the EU for fishing and farming because that's their main their yeah. main industries. And they said the day after they all voted to leave, but we still want our funding. Yeah. Yeah. And you think, are you stupid? <laughs> you know, did you honestly think that you could leave Europe and they would say, but don't worry, we'll still we'll still pay for your, you yeah. know? So there's all this kind of stuff that doesn't make sense, which mm. I think is where we're at in the world at the minute. Things, that, you know, it does make sense. You don't say fishing and farming isn't important. Nobody says that, especially not when you're in a position of power and public authority. Mm. Um. Yeah, and um, the, the, the UK is, um, generally speaking, not into meeting European standards. Um, reports today that Boris Johnson is preparing to reject demands from the EU uh, that the UK will continue to, to match European human rights standards. Um, this is <clears throat> something that has, has seemed to be in the works for some years. Uh, Theresa May, as Home Secretary and then as Prime Minister, repeatedly raged against the, the ECHR, the European Convention on Human Rights, which is not even, <coughs> strictly speaking, part of the EU. It's just a part, something that you have to sign up to in order to join the EU. Um, but the, the European Court of Human Rights uh, was something that they, they've raged against for years. Um, you know, our laws have to be made in Britain. Um, <clears throat> but now we've got uh, a government which has, in the last few months, removed the citizenship of British citizens. Uh, and now they're saying, well, we, we don't really need to have external monitoring of our human rights standards. We can, we can do human rights ourselves. Um, how, how big a concern is this? I mean, we, we, we know, as I said, we know that this, this government has not necessarily got human rights at the top of its priority list. 
Um, how, how confident are you that a British Bill of Human Rights is going to be more effective than a European, a European enforceable one? It depends on what you mean by effective. If it means get, uh, the, the government getting to do whatever it likes, whenever it likes, it will be extremely effective. But if it's about the human rights of individuals, it's horrifying. I mean, honestly, we're lucky we've got central heating now these days because they would have us back up the chimneys they, if, if they could get away with it. They are. You, you watch since Johnson got in, I mean, and he's made about six public appearances since he got in, I think, uh, and you just, it's like watching a mini Trump. He's be, what he's doing is, and I know we're coming on to this, but he's dismantling the safeguards that are in government, just like Trump's trying to do in America. He's, he's trying to get that, we talked about elected dictatorships mm -hmm. during Thatcher's reign, and my honest opinion is they're trying to create <coughs> something very similar in the UK just now. Another good reason why we shouldn't be part of it, but for anybody that lives in these islands, eh, or wants to come to these islands, it's a horrifying situation. Yeah, and um, Lizzie, as the, you know, you've, you've talked a quite a bit about human rights and um, the, the kind of threat of a, a, a dictatorial government, a corrupt government. Um, what's, what's your feeling about this? Do you, do you think there, again, do you think there is a, a plan here? Do you think there's, there's some kind of goal in sight or is it just that this government sees human rights as a problem or is it that they just want to dissociate themselves completely from anything with the word European in it? Is it just that kind of, that simple? Um, well, I think it is partly uh, the, the desire to, to walk away from, from Europe and give it two fingers up. But with human rights, I mean, I, it's really, really dangerous. I can think, you know, I think Boris Johnson's dangerous, that goes without saying. I think anybody who, who is saying we don't want to sign up uh, to the European Convention of Human Rights anymore, I know from first-hand experience of living in Malta where human rights have been dismantled along with everything else, uh, the rule of law, of course, goes along with this, which is Johnson's path. Let's just get rid of this. Um, but the fact that, that Malta is still, incredibly, in Europe mm -hmm. um, meant that we, as activists and critics of the government, had another, had another resource to turn to. Mm -hmm. And the European Convention of Human Rights is fundamental. And it's fundamental in making sure that it's not just one country. What good is it for, for, for the UK? so much as it still is a United Kingdom. What good is it for, the, for, for, for Boris Johnson to have some kind of British, British mm -hmm. Bill of Human Rights that only works here? Mm -hmm. So what happens if I come here as a visitor with my visa and all the blinking paperwork that I've gone through in order to get here and, and something happens to me? Mm -hmm. How does that, how do, does this insular British so-called human rights bill, because let's face it, Boris Johnson is not really a big fan of human rights in any shape or form. How does that help me if I'm caught up in a system and I'm not British and I don't have a British passport? Mm -hmm. Where's my resort? How yeah. am I protected? And yeah. I don't know. And I doubt very much that Boris Johnson would care. Yeah. You know, it's just another, um, we're better than everybody else, look how how great we are, and it's, it's it, I mean, they are really trying to erode human rights as we speak anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, we've already got the rise of, of the, the far right, the rise of fascism, racist attacks and so on. More than anything, we need protected. Yeah, and Sam, I mean, this is the, the European Convention on Human Rights was established um, in part at the suggestion of Winston Churchill after the war. This is something that the Tories you would think would view as one of their great achievements. This idea that, um, as, as Lizzie says, that you can't, you can't always rely on a country to monitor itself. You have to you have, to have a, a, a collection of countries that keep each other in check, yeah. that can all look at each other and say, you know, guys, you need to watch this one. Um, what's, uh, what, what do you think, what's your take on this? Is, is, there, is, there a, is there a big plan or is it, as, as we were saying, just a, a get rid of everything European? Yeah, I think it's a get rid of everything European stick, as mm. Lizzie said, stick the fingers up and kind of. But I also think as well with Boris Johnson, he is a mini Trump, as James said, mm -hmm. and it's very much <coughs> he is dismantling the human rights. And what people don't realise is it's not, I mean, we go on about human rights and people go, oh, human rights, oh, here we go. But what they don't realise is that it affects their rights as workers as well. Mm -hmm. It affects their rights as citizens. Um, 
affects everything. It affects even our children. So it is such a big thing and it's so important as part of our society. And what's happening now, even just with us in Scotland, you can see when Westminster's talking about Scotland, it's that utter contempt. Um, us, um, we, with the, the European um, Convention of Human Rights, at least we've got a backup there if we feel that um, Westminster are going to start, because I think they are, they are going to totally start dismantling the powers in Scotland, what we've got. And going by what they're doing, jo Boris Johnson's doing just now with the, the contempt of Scotland, the way he talks to our MPs and everything, these people and things, I think he he will dismantle our parliament. I don't think he's not going to. Mm -hmm. I would be surprised if he didn't. Um, and at least at the moment, we've got the European Convention um, of Human Rights and this British human rights, that's a joke. That is just a joke. That's just a way of just going, yeah, but it's fine. We'll keep some people happy and we'll stop, you know, we'll still have some sort of human rights. Um, it's just a, a sticky plaster. Yeah. I don't think it means anything. Um, British rights for British people. Yeah, I don't think it, and it's the people coming into this country, people, um, you know, people come here, live, work, and bring up their families and things. How's that going to affect them? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, we have to be already. Honest, but I mean, given recent uh, incidences, as you were just talking about earlier on, it seems to be British rights for British whites. Yeah. Yeah. You know, mm. it's uh, I I really worry about yes. that narrowing of what is considered British mm -hmm. uh, in a way that I would not even have considered under Thatcher. This government is much much worse yeah. than Thatcher's. Yeah. Well, potentially much, much worse. It's actually getting quite scary yeah, now yeah, to yeah, how yeah. they are because it's even as you say it's the British whites, but it's even this even. That's a class thing as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and even with the Scots as well, it's mm -hmm. the way this narrowing, yeah. you know, and it's very much even the way they talk about anybody that's all for um, an independent Scotland, mm -hmm. the way we are criticised, the way you know, you know, the name calling and everything, and it's just all that that kind of secular Real thinking. Kind of English chauvinism. Yes, you know. yeah, and yeah. it's and it's becoming more and more apparent and it's hatred. It is, it's hatred. It's also the speed at which they're doing yeah, it. Yeah, which is quite scary. Well, they've only been in two minutes. Yeah, yeah it's quite scary. Yeah. And the, the lack of shame about using the yes. kind of language that they use, mm -hmm. as if it's normal, and it's not normal. No, yeah, we, not we were no. talking about this a wee bit before the show about yeah. the, the way that the language that uh, senior politicians use has just become more and more degraded, that it's become more and more yeah. okay to talk about them to yeah. other yeah. people, yeah. Yeah. To, yeah. To, to, to attack groups. And we've seen right across the world. Mm -hmm. that effect. Yeah, that yeah. Is, yeah. Yeah, we were talking about that just before the show. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, um, we, we do have to move on. Unfortunately, I mean, this is obviously a very important subject and I'm sure we will come back to it. But uh, we want to talk now about uh, the Home Secretary, um, which is always fun. Must um, Pretty Patel uh, has been um, asked to explain herself after the the uh, Secretary of the of the, the, the Home Office, Sir Philip Rutnam, resigned, accusing Patel of orchestrating a vicious campaign against him and of shouting and swearing, belittling people, making unreasonable and repeated demands behaviour that created fear and that needed some bravery to call it out. He said, one of my duties as permanent secretary was to protect the health, safety and well-being of our 35,000 people. This created tension with the Home Secretary and I have encouraged her to change her behaviours. Uh, now, again, as speaking with your, your political insider hat on, James, um, this, this isn't normal behaviour, uh, either from a, a politician or from a civil servant. Civil servants typically, if they, if they resign, will, will go quietly, go and, quietly. and they, don't, they don't speak about anything. They've you know, there will, there, there will be no doubts that there have been tiffs between cabinet secretaries and senior uh, civil servants. That's, a, that's the nature of it. Politicians will sometimes maybe not like the information they've been given and maybe ask for the, the civil service to do such and such a thing and there might be, but there's never, I've never heard of anything like this. But again, it's, I mean, it's, it's just continuation of the last conversation. It's exactly Pretty Patel, now somebody who, if you include their soul, has really been misnamed. <laughs> a, <laughs> is the face of the Tory party. 
deliberately so, yeah. that smirking, cold, I don't care about you face that we see so regularly on the television now. And the arrogance and contempt that she walks, the air of that that she walks about with all the time. It's terrifying, and if anything, should make people think twice about voting for the Conservatives. It's that they would even think about her, because if I remember correctly, she's already uh, been disciplined for treason, not quite treason, but she went over and she was given secrets yeah. to some oh, Indian should, businessmen. Yeah. Yeah, she, I mean, she was sacked over um, un unauthorised meetings with Israeli ministers. Yeah, um, yeah. She was sacked from uh, the Foreign Office, uh, that thing when she was, Boris Johnson was the Foreign Secretary. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I think she was a junior minister at the time. Um, but yeah, so um, what, do we, what do we make of this? This is not the first time we've heard of um, ministers in this government um, behaving in you know, quite unusual, aggressive <laughs> ways with their, their civil servants. Um, again, is this just something we, we're going to have to get used to? No, we never get, no, absolutely not. We never get used to it. You know, we have to call it out. Uh, it, you know, the one good thing about the UK in comparison with Malta is that people do call these things out. You know, people do say, I'm not accepting it. Thank God, because it, it, it is, it's never normal. If I come into this, this studio this morning and I start shouting and swearing at you, mm -hmm. it's not normal. And I'm not a, a, a top politician. Um, so there are just basic standards of behaviour that also connect to the European Convention of Human Rights, but anyway, let's do away with that too, that you just think you, you are kind of almost born with. You know, mm. there are certain manners, ways of, of speaking to people that you don't remember learning. You just, like mm. process of osmosis, you, you just learn them. And this kind of behaviour is like, what, how did these people get away all their life, not just her, I mean there's many examples <coughs> in, in many countries of the same kinds of politicians um, and I think how did you, how did nobody slap you on when you were, <laughs> <laughs> not really but you know metaphorically speaking, uh -huh. um, when you were three. <laughs> metaphorically yeah, speaking. Yeah, but you know my mum, I, I, there's things that I say I would, have, I would have said to my daughter you can't behave like this before she could speak mm -hmm. had she behaved in this way. Yeah. You know, it just it, and I, I wonder where these where these people I want to say human beings, but I'm not sure that's the appropriate <laughs> word for some of them. Where they where they come from, yeah. and how they they got there, and why nobody stopped them and said, you know what, tone it down, or it's sort of not really very nice to behave like this. Yeah. Let alone in a top position. Yeah, well, Sam. I mean, we've talked about this before. This um, this kind of sense of entitlement yeah. um, and this uh, this attitude of being able to do what you want. Like with Boris Johnson um, himself, um, who is admitted to dabbling in drugs, at least as a teenager. Um, he's, his girlfriend is pregnant now with his nth child. I still don't know how many children he has. Um, we, he's, he's, he confessed, in, I say confessed, he boasted in his book about um, looting Fortnum and Masons after a night on the town with the Bullingdon uh, boys um, when he was at university. And it, he gets away with it. Nothing is done. Um, See that last statement, but that says it all, right? Looting Fortnum and Masons. <laughs> yes. Right? Yes. I mean, if it had been a boy from the, some of the Glasgow schemes and they had got drunk after a big night out, it would have and been... broken into Woolies. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, you know, I was going to use Woolies, but that's not there anymore. But, <laughs> but that's exactly right. And that just says it all. That's the world that they live yeah. in. And yeah. nothing happens. These poor kids would have went to jail. Yeah. You know, that's, that just says it all. You can boast about it in a book become yeah. Prime Minister. Yeah, but it's that sense of entitlement, isn't it? They're in a completely different world from the rest of us. Um, but this is what's happening and it's becoming more and more important where they are separating more away from normal mm -hmm. people. These are not, I don't like using the word normal, but they are in a completely different dimension mm -hmm. than what the rest of us live in. Um, and the thing is, what's worrying is the fact that the way they, they actually seem to get a kick out of demeaning people. I mean, Pretty Patel, I mean, when she's smirking and things like that, and the way, you know, that's demeaning. And the fact that they're getting away with that, but again, this is what people have voted in. Why have they voted in? Mm -hmm. You know, why have people voted these people in and gave them that power? And it's quite, it's quite scary.
Yeah, I think if we were to dig into how how we got here, we could be here all day. Um, I think we need a psychiatrist. We need, need a number of them. Yeah, we need a number yeah, of them. we would need. To, yeah, because it's like, why would people vote for these type of people? You know, and how have these people managed to rise to the top? Mm -hmm. I mean, because effectively they're bullies. They're, they're playground uh, bullies. They didn't rise to the top. They were born at the top. I will. Yeah, and that's that the difference. Well. They were born at the top. If you look at that circle of people there, yeah. most of them were entitled. born uh, yeah. uh, entitled. Yeah. And they're not doing anything different from what they did at school or in university or in their business life. Business life. Uh, <laughs> because they always got away with it. Yeah. You know, they were never told that you're not allowed to do this. I mean, as you, you talk about your child, nobody ever says to Boris, you've, you've seen his dad, nobody ever says to Boris, hey, 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 that's not how you behave. Mm -hmm. you know, or, or if they did, they just went, right, okay, fine, get on with it. And I, I think that's the difference. That's the problem, They've just, yeah. Yeah, the whole I lives. mean, there is a, there is obviously a, a, a real <coughs> class <coughs> issue about it. Um, I remember, I, I'm not exactly sure what the breakdown is now, but I do remember under Cameron, more than half his cabinet had all gone to Eton, all gone to the same primary school. That's right. You know, mm. I mean, that and that, that just, you know, the, the, was it the, every, everything, you know, the whole, the whole Britain, British politics is created in, in this one school um, where people are taught that they are entitled to run the world. Yeah. They're entitled to, to govern the empire. Um, that's just the way it's been for hundreds of years, um, and it uh, certainly doesn't look like it's about to change anything. I think it's soon. changed a little bit, though. I <coughs> mean, um, yes, there's always been the class thing. Yes, there's always been the private school uh, background, boarding school, whatever else, and that small clique of Etonites. Um, but there's also a lot of big, big, big money. Now, the big money's always there, probably, if you can afford to send mm. your child to Eton and you, you've got a lot of money in your bank account. But it's a different kind of big money, and we're going back to what we talking about, I think, on Wednesday, Steve Bannon, mm -hmm. Cambridge Analytica, and these kinds of movements, which, which kind of converge with very, very black money, very dirty money, organised crime on a massive scale, mm -hmm. which is now infiltrated politics big time. And I think, going back to um, what you were saying, Sam, about why do people vote for them, and I'm going, yeah, OK, that's another question because who is voting for them exactly. and what yeah. are they seeing that we're not um, we should always remember about that advertising works mm -hmm. uh, that's why people spend so much on advertising and subtle advertising works particularly well and that's what we've been getting I mean it plays, in, plays along with what you're talking about there but you know people have been getting pumped for ages about yeah. you know this is what you want you know just get Brexit done, that sort of thing, and it just sort of feeds, exactly. <laughs> uh, in 15 years' time, we'll be sitting here saying, I wonder if they're going to finish that deal yet. <laughs> uh, you know, whilst yeah. we're sort of struggling over the mouse in the middle of the table for dinner. They, uh, <laughs> but ad advertising works, and they've got that big money, they've got those big players that are influencing people. There's also the whole thing, much more in England than, than, than here, but there's always been that xenophobic aspect of things, and this whole, you know, England rules waves yeah. thing still exists. We saw it in yeah. the Brexit and we uh, uh, debate, and we saw it unfortunately in the last election as well, where it was played up a lot. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, of course, the the media plays a huge role as well, exactly. and the 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 Mail, the Telegraph, the Express, the Sun. Um, all pumping out these these kind of very uh, British nationalist uh, messages, um, yeah, and that's one of the reasons that Broadcasting Scotland exists. So if you want to fight back against some of this, folks, don't forget to support us. We'll talk about that later on, though. Um, we have to move on, though. Um, and uh, Slovakia um, has just elected a new government, uh, the centre right party, Olano. Um, has won the election dominated by a, a, an angry backlash over the 2018 murder of the journalist Jan Kuciak and his fiancée. Um, they had been digging into corruption in the Slo Slovakian government uh, for some time and uh, finally after he was murdered um, the, the, the people of Slovakia seem to have finally fought back. Um, the, the party of government, Schmer SD, had been in power since 2006, um, but have finally been overtaken by this uh, really anti-corruption uh, party, Olano. Um, they won with about a quarter of the vote, um, and are now going to have to find coalition partners 
in order to move forward. Um, but um, you know, as as somebody who's who's got a bit of experience in a country with a similar sort of situation, mm -hmm. a, a very dominant party, full of corruption, um, connected in some ways to the murder of journalists. Um, how do you does this give you a wee bit of optimism? Yeah, it did. I mean, I saw it this morning. I, I you know, was was very pleased to see it. Somebody else suggested that actually the the previous party is still very much in control. I don't know anything about that, mm. so I'll take it as at face value as a good thing. Um, I mean, the, the the in in Malta where I was, we had the, the assassination of Daphne Caruana Galizia in October two thousand and seventeen. And then very soon after that, there was the killing of Jan Kusiak and his fiance, which was shocking. I mean, both of them equally shocking because, you know, this is Europe. Uh, it's shocking anywhere, but this was two high-profile assassinations of journalists who were investigating corruption in Europe. And there are connections between the guy that's, um, I don't think he's been, has he been charged yet? I don't think so. Uh, Kirchner, who's on trial for the assassination of Jan Kusiak and Malta. His his daughter was married to a Maltese lawyer, yeah, who was no doubt washing this guy's money through Malta. Like um, Daphne Caruana Galizia, Jan Kusia was um, investigating and exposing corruption, going back to the dirty money that's flooding Europe at the minute and mm -hmm. infiltrating our political systems. Uh, to me, these things are, are indisputably connected. Um, what was important about Slovakia is that people came out on the streets and protested. Mm -hmm. And they did it en masse. And there were resignations. Whatever the reasons for the resignations, whether they were genuine or not, there were resignations and the government fell. Mm -hmm. And these are all positive things and reminds us, you know, <coughs> it is important, so important to stand up against wrongdoings um, because things can change. If you just sit and watch TV and moan, they don't. In Malta, we had a very different situation. We have a very different situation where we're still, still fighting for justice near, nearly two and a half years on. Top politicians, it goes right to the top of the Maltese government. Top politicians have been incriminated in their assassination and they're walking free. Mm -hmm. If there was an election tomorrow, the government that's in power and that was in power and, and responsible for Daphne's assassination, if there was an election tomorrow, the same government would get in. Mm -hmm. Again, a huge propaganda campaign going on via the media, which is owned and controlled by the government. Yeah, and um, this is obviously, you know, good news if this uh, if this does lead to some sort of change in Slovakia, if it does help to, to clean up Slovakian politics. And as uh, as Lizzie says, this was uh, part of this was prompted by massive. Uh, mobilization of people on the streets, the biggest protests since the, the communist era ended with huge uh, people, huge movements of people on the streets. But the, the issue of journalists, and this all ties into some of the other stuff we've been talking about, um, where journalists are being threatened, journalists are being, um, you know, I mean, Boris Johnson famously uh, conspired with a friend to, to beat up beat a journalist. A journalist yeah. Um, we've we've seen the, the British government um, recently try to exclude certain journalists from briefings, uh, and thankfully the, the other journalists who were there uh, didn't wouldn't participate in that, and they they walked out on on mass. Um, but we're we're seeing a, a general kind of shift towards this kind of uh, hostility towards journalism um, as. As uh, Lizzie has talked about on the show several times, the, the murder of Daphne Caruana Galizia in Malta, this Jan Kusiak in, in Slovakia. We've not seen anything quite like that here. Um, do, you, do you think that's a, a road that we're going down, or do you think Britain is, is maybe you know, immune from that kind of that level of corruption? Britain has always, in the first instance, done things much more subtly. And made it much more difficult for people to get information. You know, we've got the thirty-year rule and all, you know, D notices and all that sort of stuff. Much more difficult to control in the days of the internet. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's it's always done uh, things that way. But you saw during the Northern Irish troubles that you know Britain is not immune from difficult people being done away with. Mm -hmm. You know, we we saw the, we saw collusion between. The forces and some of the uh, some of the paramilitaries and stuff like that. So we, we shouldn't think that Britain's hands are, are clean on this.
But the way that even journalists here have been treated, I think, has quite significantly changed. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, it used to be in the main they were treated with respect, maybe not with the, the government, but with, by others. The problem has been that, is that some journalists have become almost like, was it they used to say when, when the journalists went with the soldiers and, the, and they, they, they ended up going with them, there was a phrase for I can't remember. Embedded. Embedded. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, some of the journalists seem to have been almost embedded with governments over the last mm. 15 years yeah. or so, which doesn't help because then all you're doing is you're just punting out the stuff they give them. Real journalists are, are either life is made so difficult for them that they don't get the gigs anymore, eh, or they're so few and far between that the, the power they had is, is not what it used to be and it's a real shame because I don't buy newspapers much anymore if at all uh, but I never liked anything better than reading a good newspaper mm -hmm. with a good piece of journalism in it. and you used to get it a lot when I was a younger man and I honestly think it's a rare thing now and that's a, that's a real shame. So we've got our own problems here, they tend not to be dealt with in, in that ex incredibly extreme way that's been happening in other places in Europe but uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't uh, completely discard something happening if the country continues to go in the direction it's going. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's real concern. Although uh, at least if there's uh, if there are elections happening, then there's always a chance that these things can be uh, can be challenged. Um, that's what's happened in Slovakia. Um, also, um, in not quite the same part of the world, but uh, it's also in Eastern Europe. Uh, today is the is Bosnia and Herzegovina's Independence Day. Uh, in 1992, they held their referendum uh, and were declared independent. Declared their independence on the 1st of March. By April, they'd been uh, accepted by the the EEC as it was then. And then, uh, just a month later, in May, they were uh, welcomed into the UN. Now, this was despite. Uh, the disputes from other countries. Some countries were not happy about this. Um, it did spark. There was a, a war in the region, um, partly partly sparked by Bosnia's uh, declaration of independence. Um, but it, it just reminds us um, that small countries can uh, can declare their independence and can do well. Can be very quickly welcomed into the international community. Um, James, what's your uh, your, your, your feelings on Bosnia's uh, celebrating 28 years of independence today? I'm always glad to see any country celebrating its independence. I think that's the way that any country who wants it should be able to do. And, and there's nothing in this, it's clearly, to suggest that it would be difficult for us to become members of organisations, you know, uh, such as the EU or the United Nations, etc. We do have to remember that this... This was a spark, but it was a spark on a fire that was almost starting and it was being fed by the, the large chunk of Yuga, the, the old Yugoslavia, mm -hmm. which was Serbia, and they were putting arms into Bosnia and Herzegovina because they wanted to control it, they wanted to become the, the greater Yugoslavia, the greater Serbian nation again. So although things happened, it had nothing to do so much with them as being independent as them not doing what Serbia wanted. Mm -hmm. And so the, the two things are connected but slightly apart. Uh, completely different from UK situation, unless of course what we're saying here is that uh, the UK would be punting arms into hardline loyalists, unionists, to make sure that there was going to be the same sort of trouble here. And let's be fair, there's absolutely no sign of that sort of thing ever happening here. Yeah, I mean, of course it did happen, as you said, in, in the north of Ireland for, for a long time. There was a lot of collaboration with paramilitaries, but there is... There's no, there's no great, uh, there's no great, great evidence for that happening in Scotland. There's no, Scotland's a, a very different context. Um, do you... Do you think some um, Scotland should be kind of? Do you think? Do you think there's anything we can learn from from countries like Bosnia, which have uh, taken their independence in much more challenging circumstances than Scotland faces? Yeah, there's always a positive um, when a, a small country or a small nation decides to go independent, um, and there's always things to learn. Um, you know, because at the end of the day. It wouldn't have been easy, there would have been mistakes, there would have been bumps in the road and it's always um, good for us to speak to these other wee countries um, and learn and see how we can make the same transition 
yes, we're still going to make mistakes. Yes, there's still going to be bumps in the road. But there's always a learning process to go with it. Yeah, and I mean, Bosnia, it's uh, not the biggest country, not the richest country, but it's it's had success. I mean, it's it's a it's a stable, you know, it's a stable democracy now. Um, is there is there anything that you think we can we can take from that? Anything we think we Scotland should be Scotland should be learning about from Bosnia? Yeah, I think again. I mean, it's twenty eight years since it it became independent. A lot of things happened in between, um, and I think any any small country that's managed successfully with a lot of problems facing it to navigate its its its. Uh, its way through as an independent country must have things you can learn. Yeah, must have. Well, we do obviously congratulate Bosnia, um, and we hope they they have a, a, an excellent celebration today. Um, but we return to Scotland now, um, where the Scottish new co Scottish culture strategy has just been published. Um, this is a Scottish government initiative to to develop Scottish culture, to support Scottish culture, um, and to to provide ways that w Scottish culture can improve uh, its own, our own profile, um, our own confidence in our, in our own culture, and to, to also improve the, the, the potential of it to, to bring in money. Um, the, the Scottish culture is a, is a great uh, draw for tourism. It's a great, and it's a, a, there's a, a, an element of export as well, of what Scotland can, can give to the world. Um, uh, I believe you have you have a, an interest in in culture. This is one of your yeah, one of yeah. your specialist subjects. Yes. Um, what did you make of the, the publication this week? I loved it. I read it last night. I was sitting in bed, and it brought a, it just brought a smile to my face. Partly because I've been living in Malta for the past twelve years, where I've been working as mm -hmm. a as a creative practitioner. I'm a writer and a, and an actor, and in. In Malta, one of the things that, that I found extremely shocking was the silence of the artists when, when, when Daphne Caruana Galuzzi was assassinated. And I'm part of that community. Mm -hmm. And this to me was, was, was horrific. Uh, and the artists are gagged because, well, they choose to be gagged because they're funded by the government and everybody knows each other. And if I do this, I won't get funding for my project. All this carry on. When I read, uh, this it read like almost like a, a, a Scottish manifesto, you know. It was a celebration of what Scotland is in this in this culture strategy. I mean, it foregrounds culture at the heart of 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 Scotland and what it is to be Scottish and the, our identity. It talks about culture in its in its broadest way. So culture is everyday. Culture is informal. Culture is also formal. It talks about communities. It talks about uh, you know. It talks about inclusion, uh, but it talks about it in real ways. It doesn't sound like government kind of. Oh yeah, we'll just we'll just do this. It sounds so real, and it talks about culture being fundamental to the well-being of a society. Mm -hmm. This is music to my ears. You know, all my life I have been teaching, making, writing, uh, you know, a, an artistic creative person. And it's always been sidelined. Mm -hmm. It's been sidelined by access to funding, access to, if you're a musician, musical, you know, the actual things that you need or access to paint materials, whatever it is, rehearsal space. To see it, to see it um, celebrated I mean, it, it is celebrated, it's there, it's saying culture is fundamental to everything. It talks about it in relation to fair work. Mm -hmm. You know, it puts everything in this one document, everything that I believe should be in there. Mm -hmm. And it sounds really genuine. It's a be I mean, maybe I'll read it again with, with slightly less <laughs> rose-tinted spectacles. But, you know, I sat and I read through this document, which I thought might make me fall asleep, because I was like, oh, you know, it's a government document. But it didn't. It woke me up. It now remains to be seen whether or not you know these things will will actually be put into action, but I don't see why they won't be. Mm -hmm. And it was another really important thing was it also to me read as we are paving our way towards being independent. Mm -hmm. I mean, it totally dis um, it totally distances itself from the immigration policies of of the Westminster Parliament, yeah. and it does that forcibly and and beautifully and well, mm -hmm. and that is a joy as well because it's there in the culture strategy. 
You know, we're about inclusion, we're about welcoming. We're not about t telling people to go back to their own countries. No, mm -hmm. we're not. And it says this just up front in language that everybody can understand and read. It's not a big government type document. It's a it's a it's an open document. It's in, you know, anybody can can get into. To me it's a joy. Yeah. Sam, um, you've been reading up on this as well? Yes, I did, because like Lizzie, I'm an artist and mm -hmm. I do creative and that's what I do. And, you know, as somebody who's self-employed in the creative industry, you are constantly up against barriers and all these things, and especially trying to get funding and things. And I sat and read it last night and like you, I was like, wow. Because I started off with a cynical view of, here we go again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is going to be, yeah, yeah, right, let's have a read. And, you know, so I went and I started reading it with the cynical view of, mm, yeah, there's going to be some buzzwords, there's going to be this and that. But no, it actually explains. And the thing I really like most of all, especially for when, um, sometimes when I'm doing work with um, other agencies and things like that, um, where I'm teaching classes or anything like that, you know, there's always a, oh, right, you're, uh, how much do you charge? Mm. Oh, really? Oh, and it's always assumed that you should be doing this work for free. People yeah. don't seem to get that you, this is how you yeah, earn your living. living. Yeah. This is how I pay my taxes, um, you know, toward contribution towards um, society. So, yeah, so I've got to be able to earn a living, but a lot of people think you're an artist and things like that. You, know, you, do. you just do it for the passion. You just do it, it for yeah. the passion, yes, which I do do, because there's a certain amount of work that I do do that um, for people who can't afford or for mm -hmm. things, and I will go in and do things and I will work with them, and um, but when I was reading it and it had a fair wage policy mm -hmm. for artists, and I was like, wow, they have actually thought about that. Yeah. They have actually thought about that because that's normally the bit that's, you know, artists and everybody will, oh, they'll, they'll do it anyway, so let's get them to do this, you know. And yes, a lot of artists and artistic people, and even mus musicians, it doesn't matter, and right across the creative community, do volunteer a lot of their time. Yeah. And it's such a hard industry to make a living out of. We do it through passion, our love, and you know, and it gives something back. And one of the things I really liked about it was when they were talking about the communities, the uh, the the geography of our landscape, everything, which then kind of went into the kind of Save Loch Lomond stuff, that mm -hmm. what we're trying to do, we're like, rather than having Flamingo Land, put something else there to do with our culture, whether it's a living museum. I mean, the ideas we've had from the community, they would love, love to have living museums, they would ha love, you know, it's about celebrating our culture, which is so rich, we've got mm -hmm. such a rich culture. Yeah, yeah, I loved it. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> I, was like, I was sitting reading it last night and I'm going, because normally when you sit and read these papers, you go, yeah, I'll put it down, I'll go and get a coffee, get a biscuit, and then go back and read it, and whatever. And I actually sat, big time reading, <laughs> reading it, and I actually quite enjoyed it. I'm going to go back and reread it again, because yeah, no, me too. there was, yeah. It was but the fact they put culture there, right yeah. at the centre. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not not a sideline to the economic, no. not a sideline to the it's social. Right it's there. right there at the centre. And it's great, and it's the fact that it's bringing, you know, it's about well-being, it's about inclusion and everything yeah and the thing is what people don't realize is when some of the things we've um places we've visited and some of the research we've done regarding save law home is see when you get people that maybe would have been sidelined by society and things like that and you start giving them things to do and start you know whether it's shipbuilding teach them skills they thrive mm -hmm. people thrive you know, and it's like, yeah, really, yeah, I love it. Yeah, definitely. Another Jim. thing they put, sorry, just while I'm thinking on it, because I loved it so much. Yeah, no, it's, it's, you know, yeah. climate change. Yes. They put the artists at, like, the forefront Front of climate, climate change. change. I know. You know, and you go, wow. Extinction Rebellion, here we, we go. go. Yeah, I mean, it's utter, I mean, it's well, absolutely what I think. The, the but it's amazing sorry. they've done the it. The curriculum <laughs> of excellence. <laughs> The fact with kids as well. Yeah. Yeah. And we need that film show on this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> the charter for human children's cho uh, charter children's for rights. human rights of the child, whatever it's called. Yeah. You know, so you go back to human rights again. It's like everything's in it. 
James, <laughs> you're gonna as, justice a, sorry. Me. <laughs> as a member of the government party, I'm sure you're fairly pleased to hear this kind of reaction. <laughs> I'm delighted. I'm, it's the first time I've ever heard such a reaction about a government paper. <laughs> but, uh, but it doesn't surprise me because, to be honest with you, Fiona is fabulous at this stuff. Mm -hmm. She takes it incredibly seriously. Yeah. She sees that culture, to some extent, is the glue that holds everything together. Yeah. And she's always present when she's talking to the groups, and she, to you know the group of MSPs or whatever. She's always talking about the importance of it. So I hope she's not listening, though, because I'm the only one here that hasn't read it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> You'll love it. You will love it, honestly. Yes. I, <laughs> yeah. Yes, I'm sure I will, but I won't love it as much as you do. <laughs> Uh, of that, I have no doubts whatsoever, and that is really, really encouraging because two people who are, you know, passionately involved in it, to see that this paper has got such a, an impact on you and you can see so much potential from it, is really, really encouraging. And what you said is right. This is another indicator yeah. of us being a separate country. True. You know, uh, this is Scotland. This is what we. This is who we are. This is what we believe in. This is what we want to achieve, and it's a different thing from what our neighbours want to achieve. So I think that's very important. But culture is, is probably the main way that we can show that. Yeah. You know, yeah. probably the main way that yeah. we can show yeah, it's, that it's not, it's, not some, it's not racist to say that Scotland has a different culture from, from England. It's Cultures just, are something it's just to be the proud way it of. Is. Every country we should be proud of what's beautiful culture. is being able to celebrate that yes. mm -hmm. without making it into nationalistic, patriotic, you know, yes, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. singing. There's none of that. Yeah. There's a real earthiness and truth about it. I mean, make, you know, culture is every day. I've been talking and teaching that and writing about it for all my life. So to see it there enshrined mm -hmm. in the in the government strategy is 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 just beautiful. Another and thing I really loved was the fact that the um, it's for the micro businesses mm -hmm. because a lot of the creative based businesses that are micro do get forgotten about. Yeah, and they are included. Yeah. nobody's forgotten. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's excellent. I'm all excited. Well, <laughs> It's, it's great to see, as, as you say, James, it's good to see people excited about things that the government are doing um, at any time, you know, if, as long as it's something that's you know, res reasonably positive. Yep. Just finally, though, um, very quickly, just want to mention, um, Gail Ross has announced that she'll be standing down at the next Holyrood election um, because the distance from her home in the Highlands and the size of her constituency has made it just about impossible for her to have any time with her family. Um, <coughs> Obviously, we wish Gail the best. Um, she's she's been an excellent MSP. Uh, but James, um, I mean, it's not quite such a stretch for you to get to Edinburgh and back um, to 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 be with your family. But I understand you are standing down to to spend a bit more time with your family as well. Um, they, they're going to be horrified at that. <laughs> <laughs> what's your what's your what's your reaction to this? And is there anything that that we can do to to make life easier for for these? Uh, more far-flung yeah. uh, MSPs. It is. It's clearly difficult, and we'll be sorry to lose Gail, along with some of my other colleagues that are, that are departing uh, next year. She has an extreme case. Her constituency is so far away and so huge, mm -hmm. you know, that whoever was in there would be finding it extremely difficult to deal with. But a mother with a young, a young son, I believe, uh, then that becomes... It highlights the issue uh, more than it might in other cases. What, uh, what do you do about it? I don't know. I think there has to be some method that, in circumstances, that, that you can participate from distance. Mm -hmm. But we have to be very careful that we don't create a uh, Skyver's Charter, if you like, <laughs> in terms of, you know, I can do it from my office. From home, yeah. you know, because Parliament has got a very important role to play. There's a lot of different things you do in there. But cases like, like Gales, where you're so far away, you know, you've got to spend some time do, doing some stuff domestically or, or you know, locally, and then get back down to Parliament, then you know, there should be some method to be able to make sure that you can participate in the democracy that's taking place at the Parliament without having to get slipped uh, and, and miss a vote or yeah. miss an important debate. And Sam, um, you know, we, we, we've talked many times, in, especially in the independence movement, about how distant Westminster is. It's in the far corner of the, the, the island. Um, and so it does kind of make it quite easy for the, the far-flung regions of Scotland and north of Ireland, Wales, to get forgotten about. Um, is there maybe a case for the Parliament 
moving around a bit or for maybe even like the, the, the Highland uh, group, the Highland regional MSPs and the, the constituency MSPs meeting as a group in the Highlands and then bringing their, their ideas in. I think in there's a possibility. A I think they need to sit down and have that conversation. Um, you know, where the kind of parliament, even if it was just once a year or something, that went up. Because like people um, like Gail, they, um, they, they bring something to the table, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and it's a shame to be, we could be, we're going to lose Gail, but we could be potentially lose other candidates that would want to stand but don't want to stand because mm -hmm. of family commitments um, or the geographical area. Um, so I think we do need to sit down and have, or Parliament um, need to sit down coming up with a solution. Um, whether it's, um, you know, the use of technology, mm -hmm. um, where, you know, the MSPs, MPs or whatever can sit and you know, um, <coughs> join in with Holyrood, um, mm -hmm. but there needs to be something, the conversation needs to be, because at the end of the day, we're wanting more young people, we're wanting people to come up, you know, through the generations to get involved in politics. I mean, that's one of the things about Scotland, which is lovely. Our youngsters are very politically aware at mm -hmm. a very young age. We want to see that, we want to encourage that, and we don't want to discourage people from getting involved at their levels due to the geographics yep. um, and you don't want people to then be, ha, be in a position where the, they are struggling to juggle mm -hmm. home life and work life. All, You've all, got to have all that. politicians do. Uh, You've got mm -hmm. to have that That's balance. At the end of the day, I mean, I understand, yeah, that it's yeah. tough, it is tough, but there's got to be a kind of a wee balance here. Yeah, yeah. Do you have any ideas on how we can make life easier for the, 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 the far-flung uh, politicians. No, I just had a, a silly idea which connects to the cultural strategy, which <laughs> ideas of the pop-up parliament, mm. you know, and just popping up every, every, in, just in different areas, remote areas, where people can just join in. Not really. I mean, I think it is a, a serious problem. And obviously, as a, as a younger woman with, with, a, with a child, it's pretty, pretty impossible. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, but but it's it's a, that's a group that we we don't want to exclude from politics. No, it's no, but I mean, putting somebody or for whatever reason that she was in that constituency, yeah. which is obviously a difficult one to navigate anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think uh, a Sam send. I mean, come on, technology enables us to communicate. It's not the whole answer. Sometimes we need to, to obviously be, to be physically face to face and physically yeah. there, um, but there has to be ways yeah. of connecting people. Yeah. Well, I mean, we we. We know that um, we have things like Skype, we have teleconferencing. Those kind of things should be should be something that we could use. Um, and we hope that whatever Gail does, that she she stays involved in politics. Her voice is, has been very important. I, I mean, I personally have met her a couple of times. I've been very impressed with her. So whatever she does next, uh, we hope uh, it's 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 good for her, good for her family, and good for the country as a whole. That is all we've got time for. We've actually gone a wee bit over time today, but that's what happens when you have three guests and all telling you how fabulous the Scottish Government's culture strategy is. Um, we'd like to thank uh, the, all three guests. I'd like to thank you for joining us as well. Um, the, the whole reason we make these programmes is so we've got an audience. Um, and if you'd like to support us further, if you're able to, please do go to broadcastingscotland.scot slash register. The address is on the screen there. Sign up as a supporter. Uh, your £5 a month makes a huge difference to the quantity, the quality and the kind of programmes we can produce here. Um, we, we have our own wee culture strategy in our heads. Um, we want to become a, a full spectrum broadcaster uh, producing all kinds of programmes. Um, we'd, love to be, we'd love to be commissioning drama, um, but uh, without, without a wee bit more money coming in, that kind of thing just isn't possible. Um, so if you're able to support us financially, please do. If you're not able to, <coughs> don't worry, the, the programmes will always be free to view online. Uh, but uh, you can always help us by telling your friends, uh, follow us online, follow us on, on Twitter at Broadcast Scott. Find our Facebook page, uh, Broadcasting Scotland. Um, tell your friends about us, retweet us, let people know what we're doing. Um, it's the, the only way we can build a, an audience is through your help, because uh, we, we really don't have a marketing budget here. 
Um, and finally, if, you're, if you want to get involved in producing some of these programs, whether it's as a journalist kind of finding and writing up stories for us for Scotland at 7 through the week, uh, whether it's working behind the camera here, learning how the control room works, learning how cameras work, getting involved in our outside broadcast unit, um, there's, there's lots, to, lots to get involved in there. Or there's always uh, space in front of the camera as well. Um, there are times, well I've got surgery coming up quite soon, we're going to need some cover uh, for people to appear in my seat during the week. So if you're, if you're interested in any of these kind of things, do please get in touch with us. There is, uh, whether you've got experience and you, you, want to, you want to put it to good use or whether you, you just want to learn, get a wee foot in the door of the media industry, um, we're, we're dying to have you. Um, so please do get in touch and let us know uh, how, we can, how we can work together to produce the best possible independent broadcasting that Scotland deserves. So once again, thank you very much to James Dorn and MSP, uh, yeah. Sam Payton from Safe Loch Lomond and Lizzie Eldridge. It's always a pleasure to talk to all of you. Thank you very much for joining us at home. Uh, we will be back tomorrow at 7. Uh, Gordon will be here with Scotland at 7. I'll be back on Tuesday for my episode. So until then, uh, have a great weekend. Cheers. <laughs>